Do you know what you do when the competition's drowning? You grab a fire hose, shove it down their throat, and turn it on full blast. <laughs> Welcome to the latest episode of Over a Pint. We're here in Vancouver at the Remax Activate Conference, and we have Nick Bailey, the CEO of Remax. Um, so, yeah, so for maybe people who don't, you know, know your history in the industry, why don't you kind of give everyone a the quick elevator pitch of your quick? History. Do we have time for this? Like it's, it's been a while. while. <laughs> And we'll uh, grab our beer too. Ah, yeah. Cheers. Thanks for, for having us. me. No problem. Thanks for coming on. Yeah. I hope this is good. Did you order this? Uh, the the bar downstairs filled me up. Uh, this is great. Mm -hmm. um, so real estate for me started in my teenage years, and I officially like to say it started when I was 17. Mm -hmm. uh, I had an opportunity when I was a junior in high school, a little bit unique, uh, and I lived in a small area at the time, and I bought two commercial retail buildings, yeah. and I leased one, and I had a, a business of my own in high school on the other yeah. side. Uh, and then when I graduated high school, before I was going to college, I decided that a first-time home buyer, 3% FHA down payment was less expensive than living in the dorm and a lot more fun. That's fair. <laughs> um, so I bought my first house the summer after I graduated from high school. And that really, I think, led me into real estate and I didn't even know I was getting into it. Yeah. And I had no idea what I was doing. Like, people say, really, how did you do that at 17 and 18 in foresight? Uh, uh, a lot of dumb luck, probably. But then I got licensed when I was 21 while I was going to college. Yeah. I've been licensed ever since. Uh, so I would say almost three yeah. decades. And how long were you selling before you moved into like the more management side of things? Um, so officially I'm going to say management because I started uh, an office with a partner. Yeah. It was 90 days. So I got my license yeah. 90 days later. Yeah. The top producer in my area, we knew each other um, and uh, families knew each other and she said, hey, let's start an office. And so we did. And so I think that's officially where some of the management started to come yeah. from. But I did actively list and sell for five years yeah. uh, before going to Remax headquarters. And then from there was Zillow or going from there to Century 21? I, uh, I, I did look up the pleasure but I forget the order. Uh, everyone gets it. I don't, expect, <laughs> I don't expect you to remember it. It's a lot. Yeah. Uh, no, so I was at Remax headquarters. I started there when I was 26. I was there for 11 and a half years, left. Yeah. Uh, went to a company called Market Leader, which is yeah, actually a SaaS-based CRM lead generation type company. Within uh, being there a year, we were acquired by Trulia. Right. And after that acquisition closed about six months later, it was within six months Zillow announced that they were acquiring Trulia. So I led industry for them for five years and then I was recruited to become president and CEO of Century 21 Worldwide. Yeah. Um, I stayed living in Denver. They were based in New Jersey. Long commute to the office. I don't yeah. recommend it, uh, but great experience. And then uh, got a call and said, hey, would you consider coming back to Remax in this capacity? So a neat ride. And how do you like being the, so you've been now CEO for two years, is it? Yeah, it's coming up on that. Uh, I was president the year before, and yeah. so they just added on to it a little bit um, to make sure that I was firmly responsible for the <laughs> results. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I've been back there just over four years, but in this role, um, two and a half, almost three. Now I'm curious, because like, using like a sports analogy, when a new GM comes in to manage a team, they kind of take time to assess, and then they remake their way. Like, these are the players I want, the coaches I want. When you come in now, having been in other places, how does that process work for you of like looking at everything and then like trying to then, okay, this is the way I want to go with it now that I've been there? Yeah, the one thing is um, I, have, I have kind of a mantra that's hashtag move fast. Mm -hmm. And I certainly believe and subscribe to make a decision quickly based on the information you have or need to get yep. and adjust along the way. Um, versus prepare for the perfect decision. And so I'll say when I, when I come in, I obviously leverage the experience that I've had, but I'm also still a student. Um, I'm still coached. I have a personal coach every other week. Is that Jared? Um, no, <laughs> no it, it's players. actually someone unrelated. <laughs> so it's funny, I did have a coach a couple years ago that was in the industry, uh, and, and this coach now, she's totally independent. She yeah. is just a growth executive type coach. Um, but anyway, going back to your original question, um, I go in and I'm not like the chop shop guy. Yeah. Like I want my own team. Everybody's yeah. fired. Forget it. Yeah. Um, but it's assess talent quickly. Yeah. Um, but then select the people that you want on your team. 
And for me, the number one thing that I look for is trust. If we work together and I can trust you, like we can do miracles together. And how do you look at it? Because I know like, obviously with technology being a big thing in the industry and like what the different companies offer. Mm -hmm. How are you looking at like okay, what people have acquired before versus, because you've been around, especially on the tech side a lot. Yeah, and, and it's you see fun for there. Mm -hmm. How do you look at like, okay, here's what we have in Remax has invested a lot into versus I think this is the better option, we're gonna go there. Um, first and foremost, in this industry, um, I'm a huge lover of tech, I do. I, I enjoy it, my friends call me tech support, they hand me their yeah. phone and say, can you do something? Um, so like. it's just kind of a, it's just kind of a passion, right? And I do believe this: technology will not replace in my lifetime a real estate agent. Yeah, I don't see that happening. But an agent that doesn't adopt tech will get replaced. Yeah. And those are two very different things. And so I come when I look at tech, I think it has to do a couple of things. One, make an agent more efficient. Yeah. The average agent logs into between eight and twelve systems. And come on, let's face it: they can't remember three out of the four yeah. passwords because they don't use them often enough. And so when we talk of efficiency and consolidation, I think that's where tech's going. But number two, it has to make a better consumer experience. Yeah. So let me give you a great example. Uh, electronic signature. Mm -hmm. I believe that e-signature has been the number one invention, if you will, to our industry in the last 10 years. Oh yeah. People will say mobile device or this, but you really think about how it's changed. If I have your house listed and we do a price change, I don't have to drive 45 minutes to get you to sign the price change. And no more six copies plus an extra one for the lawyer. Exhausting, yeah. right? And so those are, it's kind of the litmus test that I look through to say, does it make an agent more efficient or does it make a consumer have a better experience? So I'd love your opinion on this because this was like, you've been in the industry a while and you've probably heard the same thing. I have like a new technology is coming out and people are like, this is the next big thing. Oh, it's exhausting. And it's like every six months there's a new one. Shiny like, light syndrome. Yeah, like, yes, obviously mobile phone was a big one. Right. Doc, DocuSign and similar ones would be big. Um, what other ones do you look at as like, hey, this one's actually legitimately the type of tech that can change and be a huge help versus, you know, these are just ones that it's just a new shiny object that you should ignore. Yeah, the industry definitely has shiny object syndrome, which yeah. is, hey, this is the new hottest thing and it's going to change the world. Well, to me, it has to serve a purpose. And let me give you an example um, shortly after um, the pandemic. So you had this process to where you could virtually tour the house. Yeah. You could make an offer and get the paperwork electronically, get an accepted offer, and then guess what the agent said? Andrew, can you find a Dropbox and put your earnest money check in and overnight it to us? Yeah. Consumers didn't want to do it. So what tech comes into play to say it's making a consumer experience better that they can electronically transfer in a safe environment yeah. their earnest money? versus a check and finding a uh, FedEx or UPS drop off. And so I always look through the lens of saying, is this gonna make a difference or is it a fun toy? And I'll tell you a story, the first time I got my first iPad, right? Okay. Merry Christmas, it's under the tree. Got it out, didn't do a quarter of what my iPhone did. You can't put it in your pocket. <laughs> but it was bigger. Yeah. And I think a lot of tech is classified, well tech is either classified one of two ways. It's either a toy or a tool. My first iPad was a toy. I got to sit on planes and watch my movie on a bigger screen <laughs> instead of the small iPhone. But the ones that are truly a tool are the ones that really have a purpose. And I think that uh, people get distracted too much by the toys of tech. And where are you looking now from like an AI perspective? Because obviously this year the big things like ChatGPT, which is what popularized it. Yeah. But there's a ton of other AI tools like how, especially from like, do you like the impact on agents, but then also like how you're looking at it from like a Remax brand level? Yeah, both. Um, so I, I've been speaking about this this last year. It's interesting if you really think back to tech, only one big tech invention happens every 10 years. Yeah. Everything in the 10 year process until the next big one comes out is just a lot of iteration and noise. Yeah. And I a great example it. is look at like when the iPhone or touch screen first came out. Yeah. Wow, in the first year or two. Now, every version so far has a better camera, has a faster processor, but it's the same thing, right? Yeah, nothing new. <laughs> and so I do believe AI is the next big thing that is going to really impact us. Yeah. 
in a lot of ways. Like I have one son that's 18 going to college, how to write an essay. Yeah. I have a 14 year old that'll be going to college in four years. I bet he doesn't have to write an essay. Okay. And so you find people that are at opposite ends of the spectrum, scared of the new tech and all the negatives, or figure out what slices of it are great. And so, for example, um, our tech, you mentioned ChatGBT, and I'm gonna be talking about this actually on stage day after tomorrow, showing visual um, AI on how listings online and how you can almost virtually remodel them yeah. because most consumers can't visualize it will be a very positive impact to our industry. Oh yeah, it's like there's an agent I saw that she did a really good job of it where she was going through a house and then she had used at the time box brownie to do it. Yeah, love but box it was, brownie. She would go through the house and it was a fixer upper and then she'd be like, and here's an example of how this room could mm -hmm. be done. And mm -hmm. she was showing them I was like, now you could do that live That's right. with AI so much smoother. Yeah, and the whole AI, I think just the term scares people, but I, I think the reality of, let's put this into easy terms. You go on a listing and it looks dated, yeah. needs remodeled, um, and especially there are a lot of consumers that bought houses in the last three years that, yeah. that didn't necessarily love, but inventory was so low they bought it. But how about to say, what would this house look like if we remodeled the kitchen in a contemporary style, in a Mediterranean style? And all of a sudden they say, oh my gosh, this house that I hated, I think we could love. And I saw that firsthand when I was selling real estate, that people would walk in and say, no way I can live in this house, the living room's purple. Yeah. And in my mind, I'm like, it's called paint. It's not expensive. Couple <laughs> gallons, we're going to Home Depot yeah. and you're buying this house. Um, but it's okay to realize that nine out of 10 consumers can't picture what yeah. something can look like. Yeah, I'm curious what if like, people eventually do like AR, where they'll just set up, so it's like, scan this, and then it'll allow them to do the home live. Now, from like the Remax end, do you look at, especially with like, you know, OpenAI, where they basically allow you to license a lot of the AI stuff, are you looking at creating custom Remax-owned tools, or like licensing third-party providers that have built the tools already? So it's a little bit of a combination of both, but I'm going to say more the latter than the former. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, we made some big investments in tech. We acquired some companies, CRM, website companies, yeah. and um, shortly after I took over, within about 90 days, a couple of years ago, I announced that we were shutting down some of the stuff that we bought to build. Yeah. I believe you buy, build, and partner. Um, don't build something, for example, you didn't build your own iPhone, right? Uh, and so I think there is a lot of tech that is table stakes. And what I mean by that, uh, not so long ago, 10 years ago, if you had an IDX, an agent website, yeah. well, we provide really awesome agent websites, uh, and it was a competitive advantage. Well, now as an agent, as you know, you can go get an agent website yeah. for almost free or a for buck and a half a yeah. month, and it's beautiful. Yeah. And so, to me, having agent websites, no longer a competitive it's advantage, six, yeah. it's table stakes. And so, I think when people try to build mm -hmm. table stakes, there's somebody out there likely that can do it better, more cost efficient, um, and you won't get behind. Yeah. But then there are little competitive advantages of tech that you might have for a year or two before yeah. somebody else catches you. Um, and I think that's where people have to be careful. You can buy and build, but it's not proprietary. Someone's gonna copy it. Yeah. And then you have to keep improving it yourself. Internally. It's very expensive. Yeah. So we looked at, we partner with world-class partners mm -hmm and then figure out how it integrates so it's not fragmented, but it works kind of as a single system. And I think that's absolutely key. At least that's what's working for us. Yeah. And the feedback from the Remax network is they absolutely love the tech that we put in place with some of the partners we have that are staying way ahead of the curve that we could have never done on our own yeah. internally. So I'm curious, like you mentioned your son who's 18. Let's say 10 years from now, he decides he's gonna get his license. What do you think that, like, what will be different for him as an agent then than what agents go through today? So I have to think back even 30 years. People say, oh, so much has changed in the real estate business. No, it hasn't. The edges have. <laughs> How you do things. Yeah. Um, sure, do you look on a screen at a home in photos instead of grabbing the magazine at the gas station? The hot sheets. Or, yeah, hot <laughs> sheets. Right, exactly. But yeah. the foundation of the business is, I don't believe... I don't believe real estate professionals sell houses. I believe houses sell themselves. For example, let's say you have two kids and you have twins coming and I take you to a one bedroom. I'm not that good of a salesperson to convince you to buy a one bedroom with two kids and two on the way. 
But what it is, is it's about finding someone that wants or needs to sell, someone that wants to buy, marrying the process together, serving them, and getting them into the home. That's what we do as real estate professionals for a living. And so for my son that gets licensed 10 years later, none of that will be different. Will he have to write a listing description? No. Will he have to piece together photographs off of a floppy disk like I had in a yeah. camera? No. And so the ways in which the efficiency is better will just make certain parts of the job easier. Yeah. But the foundation of finding someone that wants to buy, someone that wants to sell, and then matchmaking them, yeah. I don't think will be any different 10 years from now. And I'm curious on like the side of like even services that Remax offers agents, there's tech and stuff like, how do you look at it from the perspective of like, individual brokerages within the brand setting up their own services sure that might then when remax brings in it's almost competitive to them how do you look at like is this going to cannibalize an advantage one of our brokerages have so in the remax system we're a full franchise model yeah. so every one of our offices um, and Graham, we've got over one hundred forty-five thousand agents over nine thousand locations in 110 countries yeah. and territories and our system is built on like-minded entrepreneurs coming together, but there's a certain level of independence that exists. Leverage the number one brand in real estate, leverage the network, the number one producers, all those things that we're very proud of that our agents and brokers have built and deserve. But then we also realize that these are entrepreneurs. They own their own businesses and independent contractors as agents, they own their own businesses. And I think that's what attracts people to get into this business is a certain level of, I get to build my business the way I want. And so certainly do we strive that people utilize what we have because we have scale. No. You can't go out and provide, a, a 25 agent or 50 agent company cannot provide the tech for free to their agents, but having 145,000 agents, we can provide all this tech free of charge because we have scale and purchasing power. And so, you know, as you think of the way those two come together, as an independently owned operator, you have a Remax, I have a Remax. We might be in the same city in Vancouver, um, but that's where you get to marry the value of Remax with the value of what you bring to the company. Yeah. And it's all about your culture, your value, but the two can fit together. And so we encourage people to look at how those fit together. Yeah. And here's like, Selecting brokers because like I've, I've worked with a lot like I started I was a Remax agent when I started then I worked at Integra um, So I've been around that then since then since I started an agency. I've been involved with a lot of other brands and The big ones like the quality of the broker is the number one thing If that office that individual office is good locally, that's right What process do you guys have in place from like the perspective of vetting a broker because it's not just everyone who wants a Remax franchise would get one That's right What's that process look like on your end to like that? Is this person worthy basically of opening a brokerage? Yeah, so you know, in a franchise network, we have an official application process. Mm -hmm. And that application process has financials, history, business experience, credit, background, all those things yeah. that you would think that we should, you know, go through. And then there's the idea of a business plan of what's their vision. And the reality is in this business, when you get to know people and they share what their vision is and you make sure that you check all the right boxes financially, um, that you can kind of tell where it's gonna to come together. How well do they know the market? Are they interested in building a company and investing in real estate agents? But also as entrepreneurs, some succeed and some don't. And I will tell you being around the franchising system for decades, um, the person that you vote on and say, that person is gonna knock it out of the park and be wildly successful, and two years later is average. Yeah. And then you take that person that was, barely made it through the application process, <laughs> they're a little scrappy, and all of a sudden they learn and get sophisticated, and, and you look over and say, wow, yeah. look what you've done. And so um, it's hard to read someone's passion yeah. You do your best on the process, um, and we do a pretty good job at it. The vast majority succeed and do really well, but um, life happens too. Yeah. And so once in a while you have someone that even if they make it through the front steps, yeah. um, they may not make it long term. That's just part of the business we're in. I'm curious your thoughts 
let's say like you went back to sales today, hypothetically, because this is one where I see a lot, and there's a mix of it in the Remax network and all the others, a selling versus non-selling broker. Like where would, if you went back to sales, would you lean one way or the other of like, I'd rather work at someone where the broker's not also selling, or I'd rather one where they're not selling at all? So I think that's, that's very much dependent on what you're looking for. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my good friend, Brian Buffini, uh, he said it years ago and I've never forgotten it, that when you get into the real estate brokerage business, there is a point at which it, he calls it death valley. Mm-hmm. That your personal sales are your income as you grow your company. But there's a point at which you're average at listing and selling, and you can be the best agent ever, yeah. but you're pulled in many ways. You're average now in managing, you're average in recruiting. You're not doing any of the tasks well because you're doing so many and wearing so many hats. That's Death Valley. Yeah. And so I think there's a point at which I see it in smaller areas where you have selling brokers, um, that that's a big part of their income because they don't have large companies and the margins are thin on the broker side. And then you see others that grow into the hundreds of agents or thousands of agents. Well, you don't have time to list and sell. And that's where we see people do a team. Uh, They still are the Nick Bailey team, but Nick is nowhere to be found uh, because he's running the brokerage. And so as long as you understand your priorities and what you're building, you can do both, but you have to have help in either scenario. And at the Remax of like, do you have like, hey, if you're a selling broker, here's like the kind of common trend, like here's a round in the curve of your brokerage where you should be stepping back more, or is that kind of up to the individual? Bro- like I know it's ultimately their decision as independent contractors. That's right. But from like a coaching standpoint, or like support, do you have like a, this is kind of what that growth would look like and when you should consider building the systems to step out of sales? Yeah, it depends on the size of the market, but let's take that out of it. And let's just say kind of metro areas as yeah. a whole. I think that once someone gets to around 25 agents, 25 to 30 agents, that's where they start to enter, quote, Death Valley. Mm -hmm. And they either need to decide that's going to be the size of their brokerage, or if you want to go 25 to 50, you're not going to be able to dedicate as much time to personal sales. So you need someone, or you got to get a manager on recruiting and support. And by the (coughs) way, you talk about managing and recruiting. Most people, here's a mistake that most brokers make. They hire a manager first because they need someone to help manage all these things and then they decide they want to keep growing and they turn their manager into a recruiter. Those are very different roles. But the manager, (coughs) even though you ask them to be a recruiter, they'll always retreat back to what they were hired for, which is managing. The most successful people hire a recruiter first and give them management duties, but then you can later make them a manager, but guess what they always have at the forefront? Recruiting. Growth and recruiting. And so sometimes we get backwards on how we hire these roles. But uh, there's a certain point where you just need help. In my role, I need help. Um, If I had to book my own travel and do my own schedule, and I wouldn't be sitting here with you, I guarantee that. I'd probably be lost in some other country on an airplane. But um, at some point, you've got to figure out what your priorities are, what your goals are, and how much help, and who do you need. Um, So I know this is something that you probably can only say so much about. Um, but there we go. I know where this is going. Yeah, you must. <laughs> <laughs> so there's the commission lawsuit. Here, in let the me US. Do this <laughs> Take a big sip, big sip. So there's the commission lawsuit down the U.S., uh-huh. um, which is also now just like today in the news or yesterday got class certification to go ahead. Um, not to get into the details of like merit or of the lawsuit stuff like that. How do you potentially see that in Canada impacting agents in terms of like their day to day, how they might run their business? Well, the update as of today, and you're right, um, we are limited on what we can say because we just, within the last week and a half, uh, reached a settlement in the U.S. And what we put out publicly, and I can say, is we do not believe that these suits have merit. Uh, We do not believe that there was any level of antitrust or price fixing or in any way. We settled in the U.S. um, because at a point these lawsuits are four years old or one of four, I mean, is, you know, more, more yeah. pop up. And so for us to be able to settle, we can move forward. And it offers protection to every one of our owners and agents that on a state level or federal level, similar suits cannot be brought against yeah. one of our brokers or agents. And so we made a decision to settle, um, to offer that protection, yeah. not only for our agents or brokers for the future, give them some assurance and move forward. Now, what I can't say is, 
our settlement has yet to be approved by the judge. No. In the coming weeks, um, as part of that settlement and the injunctive piece of it, we will provide more detail. That's no. not available today. How it relates to what's happening in Canada, in the last 24 hours actually, a similar suit was brought no. um, and we have been dismissed as of 24 hours ago, as have other uh, franchises. And so the judge has said, um, we're dismiss dismissing certain defendants. Some they have not, but it's only been 24 hours. Yeah. So yet to be seen on where that goes. I think that based on that decision and how that, uh, in Canada specifically, how that suit either continues or is fully dismissed, yeah. none of us know. Um, and I think that needs to happen before I can give you a crystal ball on how it would affect people. It'll be a future episode one to five years from now. <laughs> uh, I can tell you, I don't think it'll be one to five years. I can tell yeah. you probably weeks in the future. And if you want to interview yeah. me on the detail once we yeah. are able to go public, uh, we will. But I, I will say that people ask uh, what they've read in our press release, which yeah. is what business impact is this going to have? Because yeah. it is noted that there are certain business practices that we have agreed to. I will tell you that part of our public release has been that we do not believe that what we've agreed to will have a material impact on our operations. What would you say when you're looking at like, whether it's rematch or just like agents in general, like what actually could be challenges coming up for them that'll impact their day to day? Like, yes, there's things that impact the industry at a high level, but like yeah. agents on the ground day to day, what do you see as challenges coming up? Themselves, I, I, I have a good friend, he's been in the industry over 40 years, and he told me a, uh, a few back, and I, I stole this from him, yeah. and he said, there's always a boogeyman in the industry, yeah. right? And when I was an executive at Zillow during that time, Zillow was the boogeyman, and he yeah. said, by the way, if there isn't one, we'll make one up. Yeah. It's kind of what we do. And so I think that the industry itself is their own worst enemy mm -hmm. on going to the closing table and saying, this will be my last closing. Oh my yeah. gosh, what am I going to do? Or, oh my gosh, what's going to happen with this regulation or rule? Or what's going to happen here? And we live so much in what's going to happen. 90% of it never comes to fruition. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't plan and think ahead. Yeah. But I think we over-dramatize the what-ifs. Yeah. And that's what I see gets in the way of business. Plus. You know, 87% of agents to get a real estate license don't have it five years later. That's statistically true. They don't have the commitment, the systems, or the very official term, the stick to itiveness yeah. to see things it's through. A dictionary. They're not, <laughs> I don't even know what it is, but they're not disciplined yeah. enough. And, and so, you know, it's unfortunate that the failure rate's too high, but it's because the barriers of entry of getting into the business are low. Yeah. But the barriers of success are really high. And, and I think that's where. Like especially for me, the passion of this industry and where I see you know, my ability to have a role in this industry, not just leading Remax, is to try to help people avoid yeah. the five year get their license back. Yeah. That if we can help them avoid the boogeyman and, and really focus on the core pieces of the business and make people wildly successful. Right. I'm curious on the like track end, because like, I have heard the stat of like the 87% don't make five, or I think they one they say in Canada is like 80% don't make it to two, and then of that, 80% don't make it to five. Yeah, it's small. Um, do you track at a REMAX level kind of how long they last compared to the average? Absolutely. And what does that look like? Our current... Uh, you might not know the exact number off the top of your head, but... Probably. I do. Uh, I'm a big stats guy. The average REMAX agent has 15.7 years of experience, and the average in the industry is 7.3. Um, so it's a little less than half, and of course that number fluctuates every quarter or a few months. Uh, but uh, that's something that just as a network we're very proud of is uh, the average REMAX agent outproduces the next yeah. competitor two to one, but has double years yeah. of experience. So let's look at this market as an example. Interest rates are changing and people are, oh no, what's going to happen? Um, but the vast majority of agents didn't go through a downturn of a buyer's market. We had 134 months of consecutive run-ups and run-up in pricing, yeah. which was the longest seller's market like we've likely seen in our entire history. Yeah, especially in the Toronto area. <laughs> oh, it's yeah. off the charts, and it just keeps going. 
And so if you've never had to adjust your business to change for the market, you don't know what to do. I'll restart the question. Okay. Um, then we'll be good to go. <laughs> fun pivot. This is what happens. It's part of the fun when you travel. Um, so the question is around the idea of, with, like you look at Remax, you guys have the larger average of like, they've been in the industry. How much of that is because of like, agents who, they're coming to you once they're established, because it's more like they might start out at another brand. A lot of those people wash out but the ones who stick then come to Remax. Like how much is that versus like, are you guys tracking people who get their license come to Remax what their average is? Compared? We do. Yeah, of course. I mean, we love data and we watch all of that. Yeah. If you look at our history years ago, in 10, 20 years ago, 30, 40, um, the way that our economics were designed, our value proposition was designed, it was, oh, your new license? Ah, that's cool. Um, we're maybe not a training organization, so go over to XYZ Broker, get some training for a couple of years, and if you make it, come back and you can graduate to Remax. And I don't say that to be arrogant about it. Yeah. It was just the way our structure was designed. We weren't home of the new agents. No. We're home of the top agents. And, and so I like to say that, yeah, we attract great agents, but now over the years and the decades, we also make good agents great because we do have more training um, that we've ever had before with our Remax University. And so we do have a percentage of our agents that get um, licensed that are new, but here's where we're seeing most of them join. They're becoming a team member. Yeah. Because as you know, a lot of people do not get into this business as a first career. It's generally a third, fourth, or fifth career for most people. And so it's not unusual that that's why the average age is mid fifties or you know 57 and we're about three, four years on average younger than the industry. Um, but now what we're seeing is we're seeing people graduate from college or um, in their 20s or early 30s that are choosing real estate but saying, hey, I, I, I still have student loans. I can't do 100% commission. I don't have health care, at least in the US, no, in Canada, it's a little <laughs> different, different scenario. <laughs> uh, but you know what I mean? Yeah. But, uh, but that's why in Canada we see more young people in this business than we do in the US. And, but yet we're seeing them come in as team members so that a team leader can coach them up. Now on the team topic, like obviously like, oh, it's almost like the Remax kind of model that really popularized teams. Cause before that brokerages were more like a team compared to now. How do you see like in the next 10 to 15 years, do you think the team model that we currently have will evolve and change much or what? And how do you guys look at how that can impact your business? Well, let me start with the history that Dave and Gil Linegar, our co-founders, you know, started this company in 1973, so we're celebrating being 50. Mm -hmm. I know you can't tell by looking, <laughs> uh, uh, let's go there. But um, Dave was instrumental in starting teams, and he said, here's the deal. You need to focus on money-making activities, which means you need to be every day in front of someone that wants to buy or sell. Now, you still have to do the MLS forms, or today, do the website, do the marketing, you're just sold, just listed cards, get the car washed, pick up your dry cleaning. None of those are money-making activities. Literally, if you're not presenting to someone that's a potential buyer or seller on a daily basis, you didn't work. And so the whole concept that David Gale said is hire an assistant to do the non-money-making activities so you can focus on those other things. And I think that was foundational in where top producers were, were yeah. born and, and came out of Remax. Um, and so something that happened is we saw in 03, 04, 05, 06, big teams started to get big and got bigger, but so did their egos. So it was, oh, you have eight people on your team? I have 12. Yeah. But then all of a sudden the downturn, they went, whoa, because there is a law of diminishing returns on teams that where they hired one person, their income went up for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Two people, three people, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then all of a sudden around eight or nine people, they'd hire 10, 11, 12, their yeah. personal income as a team leader started to diminish, yeah. even well, though their teams were, or team members were all making money. And so you saw teams drastically reduce in size by over 70% during the yeah. Great Recession. Here's the difference today. Tech, lead generation, uh, there are over 250 million real estate leads, and 10, 11 years ago, there were only four and a half million. Yeah. And so now you're seeing these team members come in, and I think that they're here to stay, 
um, in these larger teams that are kind of a broker within a brokerage because they don't want the oversight, the responsibilities of everything that the state requires or compliance. the province or yeah. requires, all the compliance, all that. Um, but they just want to build a business within a business. Yeah. And that's where our, 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 our tagline is we're a business that builds businesses. And I think the same thing holds uh, true for teams and why in 10 years, I think you're just going to see larger teams get stronger. And at the Remax level, because obviously you guys have like larger buy, but like one of the few that could do like Super Bowl ads. Where do you look to like unique opportunities that the size that you guys have might offer you versus what others could? Like, yeah, so um, obviously that has a lot to do with the, the brand being well known with consumers. And uh, we obviously have a, a massive advertising budget yeah. between um, like North America. Um, U.S. and Canada especially, uh, that every agent contributes a fixed amount every month. Yeah. And so if their transactions go up by 100% or they go down by 50%, there's still a small sliver around just over $100 a month. Yeah. But then we have scale that where you have 85, 90,000 agents in the U.S. and Canada that have obviously this huge advertising budget. And so we have a complete department that works on impressions. And this is where agents, by the way, and I was guilty, Your Honor. Uh, I remember one summer, it was June, like I, I had seven closings in June. It was like the most I ever had. I, I was rich, but, mm -hmm. right? Money falling out of my pocket, <laughs> so what I do, I went and bought three billboards. Yeah. In the middle of summer. Should have bought them in fall or winter to drive business, not in the middle of summer. Yeah. And so um, I will say that most agents in the business, unfortunately, aren't good at tracking where their ad spend comes back, where we track every single impression yeah. so we know if we buy a radio ad versus a billboard versus digital versus tv or print yeah. we know exactly where we get the maximum number of impressions by dma or designated market area um, and it's tracked very carefully and how are you like when you're looking at that side of like ad spend and this could be very rough what would be like the spend difference between consumer advertising versus advertising that's on more on the recruitment and retention side so the way our, our marketing budgets are structured, we don't separate them because mm -hmm. the amount that I mentioned that every agent contributes to mm -hmm. can't go to recruiting. It, it, it only goes to institutional brand advertising, which is where do you see Remax? Yeah. But we also know that there's kind of a secondary benefit yeah. that where we're sitting right now, if there are 12 billboards within a mile radius that are designed to attract consumers to a Remax agent, yeah that other agents see that advertising and they might be attracted to the brand. And so our spend is not directly re related to recruiting. That's more at the broker level that they spend money on recruiting. But our, our institutional advertising is purely consumer advertising to drive the brand so that agents go back, or consumers go back to the agent. So do you guys have track of the, on the side of like, what drives the most recruits for you guys? Like what has been the most effective things to drive more recruits? Now, outside of the marketing fund, you bet. Um, and we've been talking about it today with, uh, with our owners that how do you grow? Where do you grow? How do you spend time? And I like to say, I ask people all the time, is recruiting hard? And most people say yes. And I said, no, it's not. It's not if you have systems, process, and accountability. And so there is certainly a very specific formula on recruiting, making contacts, getting appointments, overcoming uh, objections, and making sure you're selecting the right people to invite into your organization. It's a contact sport. Yeah. So yeah, the, the same thing like when I got into the industry. So my broker, it's funny when you mentioned earlier, is he wouldn't let me join at first because I was going to be part-time. Uh, <laughs> so it was a Remax office and he was like, I was mentioning because I, I had a salary and a good job and I was like, yeah, I'm going to start it part-time and maybe like down the road I'll come. He's like, oh, well, when you're down the road, call then me. we can talk about you <laughs> coming here. And then it, I like your broker already. Yeah. <laughs> he has since uh, stepped out of being a broker. Uh, he still sells. But yeah, it was like, as he started like explaining why, I was like, well, guess I'm all in. <laughs> Quit the job. Went full time. And just went in. Good for yeah. you. Yeah. So, but that was an interesting one. Where like, but it was interesting to me too. Is he did not focus on recruitment because he like similar to what you mentioned before. He had a certain number of agents. He still sold. Sure. And he was just happy at the size they were at because but like they had forty agents and like forty percent market share. Ten. 
Awesome. So he's like, we didn't need to recruit. He didn't focus on that. <laughs> yeah, it's all, you know, it's up to each individual what their passion is. And, you know, we see owners that are very passionate about agent development. Yeah. And they're, they're the best recruiters. That They're here to make sure that um, you're successful. Now I'm curious, and because I will wrap this up soon, so I have one more real question, and then there's a couple of questions people submitted. And I have to do them from memory because we have to switch to our phone where the questions are. Um, we'll see how good your memory is. Yeah, we'll see how it does. So the first, <laughs> Drink your pint and yeah, we'll see you. The, my the more serious question here. Um, obviously, like with real estate, if you look at like broker owners, the average age is pretty high. Where do you guys look at from like a support perspective, like succession planning for brokers and how you're kind of going to transition? Because like most brokers are probably getting close to retirement-ish age. How do you guys look at that from a Remax perspective of how do we support them to bring in that new generation? Well, let me start with this. I told you I've been in this business almost 30 years. Yeah. The same conversation happened 30 years ago as today, yeah. which is everyone's aging out of this business and everyone's gonna retire <laughs> next year. Yeah. Nothing has changed in 30 years. Yeah. Because, just now. <laughs> <laughs> well, now here's one thing that's different is, um, during the Great Recession, you had a lot of people say in their early 60s that thought they were on the verge of retirement. Yeah. A lot of people almost lost everything. And you know, I was on this side of the business, it was devastating. Yeah. Um, every other phone call I picked up, someone was in tears. And I will never forget the stories of people saying, I just pulled up to my office and there's a chain on the door and there's a tow truck here for my Escalade. Like, yeah. absolutely devastating. And so those people had to say, I needed one more good market. And as I love our co-founder, Dave Leninger always says, you know, he's obviously we're, we're based in Denver, Colorado, which was a big oil area. And in the late eighties, of course, the oil bust. Yeah. And he talks about all the time, the bumper stickers. And my dad was in the oil <laughs> business at the time. And it said, uh, please, dear God, just give us one more oil boom and I won't piss it away this time. <laughs> and that's what happened to brokers 12 years ago. As they said, we needed one more. So the average broker is older now, um, a decade later, and instead of wanting to retire at 62, 63, they might be 72 or 73. Um, we do, through conversions, mergers, acquisitions, work that we started a year ago to help people bring in or transition their business to new owners. There's gonna be massive consolidation in the industry. Um, it's happening now and it will happen in the next year. We went from 83,000 brokerages to 104,000. We went from 983,000 agents to 1.6 million. And all that happened in just a few short years. And so if there's anyone that says there's opportunity, we are pulling 25 agents here, 75 here, 50 here, and, and, and creating 200 agent organizations. Um, and it's really just being focused on that activity. But most agents and brokerages don't do well or think about succession planning. And do you expect with the, like what seems to be this recession that's coming up and might be here for <laughs> Whether it's one year, for, the no, we don't know. The biggest what, recession yeah. that's been talked about for three years that hasn't yeah. happened yet. Who oh, in, in Toronto, it's been next year we're going to, the bubble's going to pop, and that's been 15 straight years. Uh, but from here, like, do you think that will cause a lot of people now to jump from the business? Like, hey, this is a good time. Like, we've had a good run. I'm in my mid to late 60s. Maybe. The, and the other side is, like, how are you guys at the Remax level preparing for? Well, because like everyone seems to be anticipating the next two years, the agent count's going down dramatically for the that are currently licensed. Yeah, and it's a lagging indicator because yeah. I, I look at right now, over the last year, I believe that even on in, in Canada, tens of thousands of agents have t already taken themselves out of the business. Yeah. And in the US, hundreds of thousands of agents have already taken themselves out of the business. But they don't show up until they do a license yeah. renewal cycle, whether it be 24 or 36 months. And so we don't know the answer to that. Um, I would say that this all depends on the individual's circumstance. Yeah. Sure. Does a recession push people out um, faster than if it was blowing and going? Yeah. Um, but I, I, I don't think that that's easy to forecast. Yeah. But I just know that we're focused on, especially as a 50-year-old company, we have owners that are been in the business 40, 45, 48 years. Seen a lot of those recessions. And uh, they've seen it, but now they're done, they're tired, yeah. they've accumulated wealth, they can retire. Um, and so we'll see some of those. But I go back to, I heard the same conversations <laughs> 30 years yeah. ago when I got licensed. 
that everyone was old <laughs> and retiring and we weren't going to have any realtors in the business. Yeah. And the same conversation is happening today. So we'll go to wrap up, but and I can only remember the top one, which I did mention you before we started. So I put a post up. I did tag you in it so you can see it. Uh, Peter Shravmead had a question. Peter. I had no context to this question. My Australian buddy. I love yeah. this guy. Yeah. Uh, he's terrific. He's one of my favorite. He's one of my favorite people to run into at conferences. It's been a few years now. I mean, it, yeah, it's probably been four years since we've seen each other in person. Okay. Um, but he wanted me to ask you. How do you feel in 2023 about motorized scooter? <laughs> and you have no context on this? I have since learned it. <laughs> How did you learn it? I asked. Uh, I feel like I need context to this question oh before my I ask. Gosh. It. <laughs> like, this scooter story has haunted me. So it was two years ago, um, August. Um, and we had our broker owner conference in Austin, yeah. Texas. And we got there the first night. We're having this big coaching thing. Uh, a coach and good friend of mine, Jared James, was there. He and I were speaking the next day, and then we were moving into our conference. Thousand broker owners showing up. We go out to dinner and jumped on one of the scooters, like the Lime or Bird. I've ridden them dozens of times. They're fun. And literally went across the street, and you know on the corner where they put the traction mat that's got yep. the round dots? Yep. And some of those, now that they're getting old enough, the steering's kind of loose. And as oh, yeah. soon as I hit that pad, the steering wheel on the scooter flipped 180, hit me in the rib, and I went face first into the concrete. Yeah. Helmet? Oh no. So I had two skull fractures, um, broke my cheek in three places, broke a rib, and I was lying on the ground unconscious and I was spent the next three days in ICU. It's um, a hell of a scooter ride. It is. It was pretty wild. So, of course, I'm a good sport. I, I, I've got this, the next year I rode out to the conference, or I didn't ride out on a scooter, but they brought one out. And I ended up, I rode a three wheeled Razor big wheel yeah. and said, the staff won't let me ride anything two wheeled, but they will three. Do you still have the bird app on your phone? I do. I do. Oh, and you know the part that made me most mad? Yeah. It didn't shut off. I got charged eight hours of that rental while I was in the ICU. So we laugh about it because yeah. I, I came out of it okay, um, but I certainly urge caution to people yeah. and even someone experienced can hit the wrong thing at the right time and yeah, but uh, all my friends and colleagues and Peter included love to make fun of me for it. So we'll end They asked if cocktails were involved. <laughs> That's where we were going. Yeah. As a so the down. answer was no. <laughs> yeah. uh, it was on the way. So we'll end with one last question. Sure. If you had to give advice to an agent on what they should focus on for the next 12 months, what would it be? Uh, money making activities, but let me be way more specific, yeah. marketing. I am watching agents, whether they're new or experienced, they're right sizing their business expenses, yeah. right? People are saying, hey, the market's contracting, I need to not spend as much. And what's the first thing they cut? Marketing. It's a huge mistake. Think about, and I tell the story all the time, when you first get licensed, what's the first thing you invest in? Uh, well, it depends on if they're successful or not. Some are like they spend three months on a logo. <laughs> but when you get licensed, yeah. you're buying business cards, yeah. yard signs, setting up websites. You're telling the world, I'm in real estate. So I can't figure out why 10, 15, 20 years later, all of a sudden we pull back that marketing and get invisible. Yeah. And that's where I'm seeing, especially agents um, that have only been in the business two or three years yeah. that are starting to fail, their fears have been ignored yeah. during the pandemic because they were order takers, let's be honest. Most agents were order takers. They weren't doing the fundamentals of the business. They weren't working with their sphere. And now their sphere has no idea they're in real estate because they're not even in contact with them. Yeah. And so that's where we have invested heavily in marketing through our tech platforms to make sure you're able to market yourself, social media, um, out of home, digitally, whatever you need, to make sure that a potential buyer or seller doesn't forget that you're in this business. At our booth today, we actually had that conversation with someone where they came up and they're like, are you seeing, because obviously with the marketing agency, they're asking like, you know, what do you see like people pulling back on their spend? And I was like, it's a mix. Everyone who is like in that kind of startup to, you're still a solo agent, but st like maybe looking at it in men, I've seen them pull back. Sure. 
I would say everyone who's doing probably 40 to, you know, hundreds of transactions a year, they're putting more in now. Because they realize they can, yeah. now is the opportunity to steal that business away. So let me leave you with one thought. We're talking about whether people are spending more on marketing, as our co-founder Dave Linger has said for years. Do you know what you do when the competition's drowning? You grab a fire hose, shove it down their throat, and turn it on full blast. <laughs> and that is in the most respectful way possible. Yeah. But to your point, where you're seeing agents that are producing actually investing more in marketing because they realize they can grab two transactions from this person, three from this one, four from this one, because they're invisible to, to their sphere. And so I think some of the best producers right now understand the value of making sure the world still knows they're in real estate. And because of that, my final thought is, by the way, today in the next six to 12 months, buyers and sellers need our help more than they have needed it in the last five years. So if people want to reach out to you or Remax in general, what's the best way for them to, their, and keep in mind, mostly realtors in Canada is the audience of the show. Yeah. What's the best way for them to get in touch? Well, of course, if you're just interested in learning about Remax, go to Remax.com. If you're interested in contacting me, very easy to find. Nick at Remax.com uh, is an email address, but I'm all over social. So um, Facebook, I don't spend as much time on Insta, TikTok, but uh, yeah, pretty <laughs> easy. All my TikTok stuff is personal and ridiculous yeah. <laughs> and just fun nonsense. Um, but on the Remax channel, I do uh, I do business stuff there. So social media or send me a note. Sounds good. Happy to help. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for Thank having you me. Very much. And stay tuned for next week. And by next week, I don't have another guest planned yet. We'll figure that out before this airs, hopefully. Uh, but stay tuned. We'll have another episode coming out. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you soon.